Okay, welcome back to this session. We're not going to talk, we've addressed restorative justice several times already, but we'll now, we will now have a dedicated panel uh, on restorative justice with three papers in it. One which uh, from uh, uh, Shirley uh, Julich, who is not here, but will give her presentation online, or it's a recording. And then Hilde Fula and Paul Stotter uh, will give a talk, and then Linsa, Lindsay Poiter. So they will sit down there in the meantime, and in the end, they will, it will come, the two of you will come up, and we also have some more um, answering to questions from Shirley. So I'm going to start the recording. Kiora, how to cut. It's very sudden, sorry. <laughs> I thought we'd have like a two second or something, but we didn't. So, okay, uh, be prepared. Kiora, how to cut. Kanui te mihi kia koutou, no Aotearoa aho, ko ta koutou Shirley Yulik aho, tena koutou, tena koutou, tena katoa. So let me just share my screen before I explain what I just said. So um, I just introduced myself probably quite poorly in te reo. I have been learning te reo for some years now, but it's always difficult to get the pronunciation exactly right. So um, I am Dr. Shirley Ulick, Associate Professor Shirley Ulick, and my colleague Polly Jung is also Associate Professor. We're both employed at Massey University. So I'm engaged, I work with uh, Project Restore, and Polly is the um, uh, quantitative uh, methodological guru who helps me with this research. So <clears throat> this presentation reports on an evaluation of Project Restore between 2016 and 2019. And we've specifically in this particular piece of research not focused on satisfaction because this doesn't tell us if victim survivors have experienced a sense of justice. So the aims of the research were to explore the potential of restorative justice to deliver a sense of justice to victim survivors of, uh, of Project Restore's restorative processes. We were keen to find out if by using Kathy Daly's um, victimization and justice model, we, would we be able to determine this by using this process? And of course, we wanted to provide feedback to Project Restore. <clears throat> so New Zealand, a little bit of background, New Zealand's uh, legal system is somewhat unique. Restorative justice has been legislated for since 2002. Initially, it was an opt-in system of access. Victim services and the courts would attempt to identify suitable cases and refer them to one of the various provider groups throughout New Zealand. This is for generic restorative justice. In 2014, legislation changes meant that access to restorative justice became an opt-out system. The criteria for uh, Referral to restorative justice were that offenders must plead guilty, there must be one or more victims, one or more persons harmed. And if both victim and offender agree to a restorative process, this would go ahead and the outcomes of the process are reported back to the courts for judges to consider as they determine sentencing. Project Restore is a community group providing restorative uh, processes to cases of sexual violence. We convened in 2004 and began providing restorative processes in 2005. To date, we're the only group funded to provide court refer referred restorative uh, justice to cases of sexual violence. And so the majority of cases are referred by the New Zealand court system to, to us. But some cases are referred from the community, for instance, by police, counsellors, therapists and the like. And we have had perpetrators and victim survivors self-refer. Other provider groups throughout New Zealand also re receive community referrals, but they're not funded for the court referrals, not as yet anyway. So um, Project Restore's practice model is an expanded version of New Zealand's conference model, which is similar to the family group conference of New Zealand's youth justice system. A survivor specialist supports the person harmed um, and their supporters, and a ha harmful sexual behaviour specialist supports the person responsible and their supporters. 
A restorative justice facilitator with in-depth knowledge of sexual abuse facilitates the conference. Together, these three people determine risk and readiness for all stakeholders who plan to participate in the process. A clinical supervisor provides oversight to the team. She's familiar with the case, but hasn't met any of the stakeholders. Project Restore's aim is to keep the victim survivor central to the process and for everyone <clears throat> to be safe and treated impartially. Indeed, on occasion, we use balanced partiality in that rape myths and the minimization of the harm caused will be challenged. There's quite some literature attesting to the difficulty of victim survivors of sexual violence to experience a sense of justice. Accordingly, researchers have made efforts to identify those components necessary for victim survivors to experience a sense of justice. In my research with victim survivors, I came to the same conclusion and argued that components of justice were not merely being passive in the process, were having a voice and being able to ask the questions like such as those there identified, acknowledgement that the harmful sexual behaviour occurred and hearing that the behaviour was wrong and for the person responsibility to take, the person responsible rather to take responsibility and demonstrate accountability. Just as a note, in earlier work, I reported that victim survivors I worked with didn't appear to seek revenge or punishment. Project Restore is one of those justice me mechanisms that Cathy Daly speaks of. And as she pointed out, as innovative justice mechanisms emerge, we need new tools for evaluation that move us beyond mere satisfaction surveys. Those that engage with restorative justice are highly motivated to make it work and perhaps a prejudiced cohort. Daly argued that her model would enable evaluations and comparisons of justice mechanisms across not only programs and jur jurisdictions, but also countries. And she associated five justice interests with her model that are similar to the justice, and, um, justice understandings of Zia, Herman and myself, among others. So, she defined these uh, the justice interests as participation in the process, voice in the process, that is being able to tell people their truth, hearing an acknowledgement of the harmful sexual behaviour, vindication is hearing an acknowledgement that, that those present thought that the behaviour was wrong, accountability as wrongdoers taking responsibility for their behaviour and attempting to do something about it. So we designed an anonymous questionnaire asking questions of victim survivors about these five justice interests. Invitations were sent out by Project Restore staff to those who had completed a restorative process. And a total of 37 victim survivors responded to the questionnaire. Historically, we found it difficult to engage with victim survivors after the process. And this is partially due to our funding model and limited staff available to encourage victim survivors to participate. The, pro the project was peer reviewed and it was determined as low risk and subsequently a notification was advised and entered into the Massey University Human Ethics Register. So to better understand um, this particular justice interest, we asked questions about their active participation throughout the process and whether they were able to ask questions about what happened to them. As you can see, their responses indicated that they were engaged in the planning and were, were able to ask questions. And over 85% were satisfied with their level of input into the restorative process. Perhaps I should point out at this point that for most of these questions, respondents were able to choose from a Likert scale of answers ranging from yes, mostly not sure, not really to no. We reported here on only those who indicated yes to mostly. I have presented the findings in logical order as the victim survivor moves through the process, which is also the order in which the questions were asked. So this justice interest asked questions about their ability to tell people what happened to them and its impact on them. Truth telling, some people would call it. The possible responses for these questions were mixed. Some were a Likert scale, others were a yes or no. And we reported on those who indicated yes to mostly or yes. Questions attempting to explore validation that victim survivors might have experienced 
focused on the acknowledgement of harm, not only by the wrongdoer, but also by others present in the conference, and whether this acknowledge, acknowledgement gave them any satisfaction. Those question, these questions also explored whether the harm was considered serious and if they had been able to talk about the impacts of sexual violence. Possible responses to this set of questions were yes or no, and we've reported on those who indicated yes. In this bracket of questions, we aim to determine if there had been some understanding that the actions were wrong legally and morally, and if there had been any um, condemnation or uh, censure within the group by other participants. Again, the uh, possible responses to these questions were yes or no, and we've reported on yes. So as you can see, there was quite some, um, there was quite some vindication. So accountability was the last justice interest. And here we uh, attempted to find out if wrong wrongdoers took responsibility and how they vindicated the person harmed, that is demonstrated accountability. Did they agree to undertake some actions as a result of the agreed conference outcome? The possible answers to these questions were yes, no, or don't know, and we report on those who responded yes. And I should note that in three of these cases, there was no police investigation. So what does this mean? Well, we believe that the results of this questionnaire indicate that this particular group of victim survivors experienced a sense of justice, or very, uh, certainly um, perhaps not 100% as we would have liked, but certainly they've come close towards experiencing a sense of justice. However, we do need to remember that restorative justice is not a panacea, and it's not for everyone. And of course, it may not be applicable for every case, but it is an important way to meet the needs of victim survivors as they pursue justice. Because restorative justice can provide um, opportunities that the conventional criminal justice system cannot. However, clearly there's always room for improvement and Project Restore is constantly revising their processes and the feedback from this evaluation will certainly as assist with this. And this aspect is so important, uh, well, it is so important and we have managed to secure funding to maintain an ongoing evaluation that will enable us to monitor and continue learning how best to provide victim survivors an experience of a sense of justice. So for now, I will say kia ora koutou katoa, nga mihi, and um, may your day go well. Okay. She also answers some questions. I'm not sure, Ellen. Hmm? That's for the discussion. Okay. And I don't know how to fix this, but Ellen will fix it. Uh, uh, so now I, I welcome Hildefula Antonsdotter, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Edda Research Center here at the University of Iceland. And uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I have my notes here. Let's see. Hello, everyone. I'm so short. Maybe I'll do a little bit of this. Thank you. See you. All right. <clears throat> yes, uh, so my focus titled Beyond Restorative Justice called for innovative justice practices. First, some interviews with um, survivors in. in in Iceland. So, <clears throat> in Iceland, the Me Too movement has continued to make waves as survivors have continued to speak out, particularly on social media where alleged offenders are increasingly being named publicly. And we have a number of high profile cases uh, involving accusations against well known men in Icelandic society. And these include media figures, musicians, politicians, footballers, and businessmen. This has led to a heated public debate about the validity and consequences of publicly naming alleged offenders. And my sense is, and we can discuss this maybe also with the Icelanders hereafter, my sense is that it's in this context that restorative justice is increasingly being named or mentioned as an alternative to public naming of alleged offenders. So that's kind of an interesting, I think, situation. 
Uh, and yes, in a few words on, uh, on the Icelandic uh, uh, situation. So the Icelandic Prosecution Authority does not refer cases of sexual violence to mediation except for minor offenses. I think it's only Brot, which is a very minor offense. Uh, but the coalition government uh, agreement stipulates that applying mediation in case of sexual viol violence is to be considered, and now that work is underway, as far as I understand it. So there are experts within uh, uh, public institutions that are now looking at this. And therefore, it's important to gain a better understanding of how survivors of sexual violence view restorative justice. Hmm. Here are no notes. Oh, yes. Right. So the aim uh, of the study is to explore uh, the potential of using restorative justice in cases of sexual violence based on interviews with 35 victim survivors in Iceland. And the research question is, how do survivors of sexual violence view restorative justice? How could an alternative justice process meet survivors' justice interests? And this is based on interviews that I did um, as a part of my PhD thesis. So the, so the interviews themselves are a bit old. They're from uh, January 2005 until January 2017. So this was before the Me Too movement, which I think is, is also important to keep in mind. Uh, and I'm, I'm using thematic analysis uh, for this. So first, uh, a little bit on uh, feminist critique of restorative justice. We have a lot of feminist critique of, of restorative justice. <laughs> so many feminist scholars have been very critical of using restorative justice uh, historically in cases of gender-based violence. And, and numerous risks have been identified. The risk of reprivatizing gender-based violence. So the women's movement has fought very hard for public recognition of sexual violence and for the criminal justice system to take it seriously. But restorative justice has been said to, to usually kind of, kind of maybe privatize justice, reprivatize justice again, and uh, often without any public acknowledgement. Then there is the risk of survivors' uh, safety, um, uh, as restorative justice can allow for re-victimization due to the power imbalances of the parties. The inability to guarantee offender accountability and responsibility, which is, I think, a kind of a key, a key issue. Uh, and the inability to guarantee that community members will be supportive to survivors and contribute to holding offenders to account. That's another uh, uh, worry. And then there is the inadequate, uh, inadequacy potentially in addressing the broader structural inequalities of race and class in which gender-based violence is indeed embedded. And here we're kind of entering into transformative justice a little bit. Uh, but uh, and it's important to note that Kathleen uh, Daly uh, uh, wrote in 2016, she notes that the standard restorative justice practices require major revisions if they are to be victim-focused and appropriate for cases of gender violence. Uh, but so we have, like Shirley Julie was just talking about, we do have uh, examples of specially designed victim-centered restorative justice programs that have taken this critique uh, on board and have tried to meet that in some way in the, in the way that they uh, design uh, the restorative justice programs. So the best known programs uh, uh, that have been designed in such a way are, are well, firstly, I guess, the, the Project Restore program in Arizona, which, as far as I understand, has discontinued due to lack of funding. Please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. And then there is Project Restore that Shirley was talking about in New Zealand, uh, which is inspired by the former. Uh, and is kind of, I think, by many considered the gold standard and something that many refer to. Uh, and evaluations indicate that these can meet, these restorative justice uh, uh, programs, especially designed ones, can meet victim survivors' justice interests to a degree. Uh, they report feeling safe, listened to, supported, and treated fairly, very often. But results uh, tend to be mixed when it comes to victim survivors' perception uh, of the offender, of offender accountability, which is a key component of, of survivors' understanding of justice. So, uh, Cases are referred to restorative justice either from uh, prosecutors who deem them provable at trial, like Shirley was talking about, or from the courts where offenders have acknowledged wrongdoing or have pleaded guilty to a crime. Uh, and this is, of course, not representative of, of the majority of cases where those accused readily deny accusations of sexual violence and charges are seldom issued. 
Uh, but then it's important also to mention uh, 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 studies uh, that have identified or, or where, where they're studying uh, restorative justice processes in these cases independent of the criminal justice system. And here, of course, uh, is, the, is the study uh, by Claire McLean uh, and company, uh, which is uh, uh, excellent. And they conducted an exploratory study of restorative justice conference, which involved an adult survivor of child rape and other sexual abuse in the UK. And interestingly, the restorative justice conference was conducted independent of the criminal justice system, and the person responsible for the violence of the perpetrator was willing to participate. Uh, and after the conference, the survivor was asked if she would recommend restorative justice to another woman in similar circumstances. And she is reported to have replied that if a woman was at the right stage in her recovery, sufficiently strong to undertake a conference, and after ensuring the necessary professional support and careful planning, then she should take a deep breath and do it. So this is a, a, a document example of how restorative justice can be conducted independent of the criminal justice system and with good results for the survivors. So we have this kind of mixed, mixed picture. So now back to my study, uh, to introduce you uh, to the participants in my study. So the criteria for participation was to be 18 years or over and, and self-identify as having been subjected to sexual violence. And I interviewed 32 women and three men and the age ranged between 19 and 67 years of age, uh, and they had experienced different types of sexual violence, like you can see on the slide. Uh, and the offenders were men and boys, except for one girl and one woman, and this included all kinds of different uh, 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 people, like you see on the slide, I'm not gonna kind of go, go into it, you can you see it. So, uh, and it was a semi-structured questionnaire, uh, and I asked them, uh, so I asked them questions, uh, but like I was uh, saying before, restorative justice is not used in cases of sexual violence in Iceland. So none of the participa participants had experienced such a process. Uh, and some were not very familiar with restorative justice, while others were very familiar with it, had read about it and, and knew about it. Uh, so the semi-structured questionnaire, it included a description of the aim and process of restorative justice along with related questions. But just bear in mind that you know, these are uh, participants that have not experienced it themselves. So that's, of course, uh, something to keep in mind. And so here are the themes kind of that I, that I constructed uh, out of these, uh, out of these, um, out of the data. Uh, and so I have a few quotes here for you. So uh, restorative justice is based on the willingness of the offender to want to undergo the process and take responsibility for their actions. Uh, and that is uh, usually not the case when it comes to sexual violence, uh, as we know. So here, a woman in her 20s, she said, the first thing that comes to my mind is why would offenders want to go through with this? Why? Based on my experience, it's difficult to get offenders, doesn't matter what kind of offenses they have committed, to admit uh, to what they did, let alone to talk about it with victims and compensate for it. What's the incentive? No, really, I'm asking. I was really wondering, how, why, would, why on earth would they participate in this? The next theme uh, was distrust uh, of offenders. So most participants had no reason to believe that offenders would be willing or have the capacity to participate in a restorative justice process and be sincere about it. And here I have two quotes. The first one, a woman in her early 20s, she said, I think he's a psychopath and that he would never take any responsibility. He wouldn't know what I was talking about. But perhaps it's enough that I tell him what I need to tell him, but I would be afraid that he would think that he was the victim in all of this. And then I would be even more angry with him and I can't be having that kind of energy in my life. Another woman in her mid 20s said, there are so few of them who admit to what they've done. So, you know, I don't know how many would participate in such a process and be sincere about it. I think that's the most dangerous aspect of this process. And the next theme, demand of unjust exposure. So many participants described a deep sense of uncertainty about their own reactions uh, if they were to meet the offender in a restorative justice meeting. And restorative justice meetings demand that survivors expose themselves in return for this uncertain promise of gaining a sense of well-being or a sense of justice. Uh, and a woman in her 40s said, I thought restorative justice was a great idea and something I wish people would increasingly use until it happened to me. Now the tables have turned. I wouldn't be able to sit in front of them and tell them how 
this has impacted me. I just can't. Uh, if I would see them, I'm so afraid of becoming angry. I don't know. Perhaps I would just say something terribly ugly. I don't know. Perhaps I would just give them a hug and wish them good luck in life. I don't know. And a woman in her 40s, another woman in her 40s said, you have to go into these circumstances because that's supposedly the way to work your way through the experience. That therefore becomes a demand to expose yourself, which is supposed to be the way through. I think this is damn tricky. Uh, and the next theme that came up uh, was uh, that of conflicting processes. So while promptness is considered important when it comes to holding offenders to account, it can take victims a long time to overcome trauma and gain a sense of re-embeddedness, to feel fit to participate in a restorative justice process. And a woman in her early 20s said, today I would be ready to meet with him, but a year ago, no, absolutely not. Before, I wouldn't have been mentally prepared. I hadn't processed the experience. And another woman in her 20s said, perhaps some years later, but still, what's it good for then? I would never have been able to go through this. If he or someone else would have said, can I compensate for this? I would probably try to kill the man. I would have jumped across the table and tried to take his eyes out. You know, at that time, no way. Then uh, there is this uh, theme of uh, offender accountability. So when I was kind of asking them, what kind of alternative vision would you have about the justice process? So in most cases, participants neither wish to meet with the offenders nor restore or reconcile a relationship with the offenders. Instead, they emphasized offender rehabilitation for the purposes of holding offenders to account and increase their capacity to take responsibility for their actions. So a woman in her 20s said, wouldn't it be possible to make offenders undergo some kind of a process like this without the victim? You know, to undergo, undergo some form of treatment or counseling while they sit in prison, where they have to face the consequences of their actions. Another woman in her early 30s said, I'm talking about a long process, long rehabilitation process, where this twistedness, twistedness would be tackled. That's what I would want. And then it wouldn't be a court judgment, but he wouldn't be getting off easy either, you know, just go to therapy and say sorry. It would have to be a very professional and very serious. Uh, and the final theme, so according to participants, the necessary societal conditions entail support and understanding for survivors, as well as creating both societal pressure and space for offenders to take responsibility for their actions, but at the same time without justifying the violence. So this is a, this is a balancing act. Uh, and a woman in her early 30s said, I understand that his mother loves him, but she hasn't denied what he has done, at least not in my case. But I think people have a really hard time with this. As a society, I think we need to develop more on that front. You can be a friend of the perpetrator, but then people have to understand that you can support the survivor by keeping the perpetrator responsible. If you're going to be a friend of the perpetrator, it becomes a societal responsibility. I feel that's missing. So, summary of the findings, this is my final slide. So firstly, participants generally did not share the main aim of restorative justice, that is reconciliation and the restoration of the relationship between the parties. Instead, they emphasized the importance of holding offenders to account, offender rehabilitation and offender accountability. Secondly, standard restorative justice practices usually aim to set up a meeting between the offender and the survivor for the purposes of restoration for both parties. However, participants generally had no wish to participate in such a meeting due to their legitimate distrust of offenders, fear of unjust exposure, and the conflicting processes of restorative justice on the one hand and regaining a sense of control over their lives on the other. Thirdly, many participants envisioned an alternative justice process where they did not have to meet the offender, a type of offender accountability process managed by professional counselors and therapists. Uh, and fourthly, while restorative justice can work in some cases, as other studies have shown, it is also important to look beyond restorative justice and develop innovative justice practices and procedures in line with survivors' justice interests. Uh, it's also important to note, however, that in the Icelandic context, it's important uh, uh, yeah, to, to well, note <laughs> that we have been seeing increased societal support for survivors and increased pressure on alleged offenders to take responsibility for their actions, which is a critical component of creating the conditions for alternative processes. 
Uh, and then also, of course, just, you know, throw that in there. Further research is needed to better understand <laughs> if restorative justice can work better in some cases than others based on survivors, offenders, and the type of offense or such offense. So that was Thank you. Thank you. And now we will hear the presentation from Lindsay Pointer, who is an assistant professor at Vermont Law School. And is part of leading the National Center on the Restorative Justice. Um, do you have a PowerPoint? I do, yeah. I think it should be on the, the pew. Mm. Maybe the next, next one? It moves there so we it, go. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know who is moving it. <laughs> There's magic going That on. was magic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, all right, well, thank you all so much. This. Um, has been just a fascinating and inspiring day already, and thank you for bringing us all together. Um, I have a good friend and colleague who's a restorative justice scholar in Belgium who talks about imagination being the most powerful political faculty that we have, and so Claire, when you left us off at the last panel talking about imagination, I was just thinking about how much opportunities like this to hear about great work happening, progressive work happening, spark the collective imagination. So grateful for that. Um, and grateful to be in Iceland for the first time ever. I discovered that I have some black sand in my hair, which is my proof that I've been enjoying the beauty of this country in addition to this day. So um, grateful for all of that. I, uh, so I want to just start by giving a little bit of background around my own experience in the restorative justice field because it's going to help situate um, what I'm talking about today, which is restorative approaches to actually preventing sexual harm. And this work is grounded in a few different uh, institutional affiliations. So uh, just to first say, my current role is as an assistant professor at Vermont Law and Graduate School. We have a master's in restorative justice. Um, so I teach in that program. And then I'm also uh, the principal investigator of some grants that we have from the Bureau of Justice Assistance to build a national center on restorative justice that's um, promoting restorative justice research and education in the US, which uh, has been really exciting because prior to this, there hasn't been a lot of federal money or support for restorative justice. It's been very state-based. Um, and so while it also has complexities, it's, it's kind of an awesome um, opportunity for us in the states uh, to you know, think about what scaling up restorative justice looks like with, with some federal support and money. Um, but prior to kind of Moving into academia, I was a restorative justice practitioner, so I worked with a restorative justice diversion program in Colorado. Um, most of the referrals came directly from police, and it was for juvenile and, and adult responsible parties. I use the responsible party and harmed party language just to avoid the kind of stigmatizing impact of offender and victim. It's pretty common in restorative justice. Um, misdemeanor through felony level offenses. However, we were not allowed to accept sexual harm cases with the exception of image-based sexual harm. Um, and so we actually ended up receiving quite a few like teenagers and young adults who had shared um, intimate images without consent um, and were able to run restorative processes for those, which, which went quite well. We, we leveraged um, teen and young adult facilitators in those places quite a bit because of the, um, it's easy to feel pretty out of touch with the tech world. Um, uh, and so, um, that I brought that experience with me to New Zealand, which is where I did my PhD. And while I was there, um, I was at Victoria University of Wellington, and we were working on implementing restorative justice within the university for student, faculty, and staff misconduct, although most of it was student. Um, and so that's kind of where this particular story starts, but wanting to ground that in um, knowing that the experience I bring to that and to kind of my current work is experience as a practitioner and um, really seeing every day the positive impact for um, both harm parties and responsible parties and their surrounding communities that the restorative justice process can bring, not always, but, but often. Um, and to just say right up front that despite that restriction for many US programs to not use restorative justice in cases of sexual harm, my personal feeling is that there's no harmed party to which I would deny the opportunity of restorative justice if they feel that it would be helpful in their healing journey um, when that's done you know, in, a, in a way that is um, with skilled facilitators who are prepared and are um, ensuring that further harm isn't caused. 
<clears throat> so I was at Victoria University of Wellington. We are implementing restorative justice as an alternative response for student misconduct largely, but also staff and faculty. And we started you know, seeing exactly what um, came up in the first panel of the day, that prevalence of sexual harm in the university context. Um, and because we all of a sudden were offering this alternative pathway that cases could come to restorative justice instead of going through standard discipline procedures, we were being flooded with sexual harm cases, um, which I think speaks to that kind of underreporting that we see quite a bit. Uh, most of the cases we were receiving were uh, cases between friends. A lot of the like intoxicated, really all the stories that were shared in the first um, and second panels today. Uh, and where that was coming from, you know, the stories that we were hearing over and over again was harmed parties saying, you know, this is my friend. We're part of a larger group of friends. I don't want to ruin his life. And I want him to know this was wrong. I want him to know that it hurt me, that I've been affected. I want to know that he's not going to do it again. And restorative justice can offer a way to meet some of those justice needs. And so we kept having those cases coming to the restorative justice process. Uh, and they were going well. You know, we were feeling like we were able to um, offer a measure of justice that wouldn't otherwise be achieved to those harmed parties, to responsible parties as well. Um, but we started thinking, could we get ahead of this a little bit more? Like, could we use some of the restorative justice tools in our tool belt to think about how to prevent sexual harm, to get... Um, you know, to get to the root of the kind of broader cultural conditions within the university and more broadly that are giving rise to sexual harm cases. Uh, so what we started experimenting with is this idea of combining two models. So the sustained dialogue model is somewhat common at US universities and it's the idea that there should be a space for students to have ongoing conversations um, separate from classes over the course of the year about big issues, the big issues that impact um, our university communities and society. So you know, sexism, racism, like all these big issues and what they mean for our lives. Uh, I personally have been part of one of these sustained dialogue groups uh, and I enjoyed it, but the observation of myself and then also other researchers who have looked at this process in universities is that it tends to fall into a lot of the same pitfalls of other dialogue processes in that um, there's these power differentials in any time there's dialogue that don't really get addressed. You know, we hear from a few voices um, more often than others. Uh, it's hard to have like a structure that kind of moves the dialogue forward. And so our thinking was, why don't we combine this idea of having sustained dialogue spaces on university campuses with restorative circle practice, which is this, you know, ancient human technology to sit in a circle, ask a question, go around and um, all answer the question, but has these profound relationship building and dialogue enhancing kind of properties, um, and also has a structure that helps to ensure greater equality of voice and um, a chance for everyone to participate. And so um, that's how we landed on this idea of a sustained restorative dialogue as a preventative restorative approach um, to address those broader culture, cultural issues. So it was sustained in that it was run over four sessions with the same participants, so really going deep in four se sessions. And it was restorative because it used circle practice as kind of the process, um, but also moved really intentionally through the main steps of a restorative analysis. So understanding first what's happening, then what are the impacts, how have people been affected by this, and then what's needed to repair the harm and to make things right. Um, so I'll show you in a second how kind of our circle structures um, mirrored that restorative analysis arc. Um, but again, with the broader aim of really getting to a climate and culture analysis of how can we collectively look at what's happening that leads to these incidents of sexual harm taking place in the first place. So, um, this was session one, um, circle number one with the group. So uh, before I jump into this, I should say that uh, we piloted this for the first time right in the intensity of Me Too movement. And I think that had a huge role um, in us getting permission to do it, honestly, because we piloted it with the law school at Victoria University. Um, there had just been some very public incidents of sexual harm within that community. Administrators were grappling with what to do, and so that made them open to us trying this. Um, 
And for the initial pilot, we sent out you know, a few different messages and asked students to opt in to the process um, and then uh, you know, controlled for like trying to get a good balance of gender, balance of um, you know, a few different factors. Uh, so in this first circle, just to run through briefly the um, structure of the process, uh, we you know, did a welcome and introduction um, to the approach of moving through the restorative analysis. Um, and then we had some relationship building and norm establishing circle questions, so asking everyone to thanks, um, share their name, story connected their name, you know, it's kind of just like these fun relationship building questions that a little bit get to a deeper you know, layer of who people are, where they come from. Um, you know, why are you here? And then this really essential question in round four of what do you need in order for this to be a safe and supportive space? Um, that then, uh, we had further dialogue around that that turned it into collective norms for engagement in the dialogue um, and created a visual of those norms that we then brought back in all the other sessions so that we could you know, collectively uphold those norms. Um, number two really was diving into the what is happening restorative question, so let's understand the issue together. Um, we started again with a little more relationship building, getting people comfortable with circle structure. It can feel a little funky at first. Um, and you know, revisiting those collective norms. And then this was round three. This was such an interesting question around messages from parents, teachers, et cetera, that you received about sex growing up. And really understanding that it's not just the university culture that's kind of broken in this way. It's, it's much broader. And we're all coming with this messaging. Um, that you know influences us. Um, then you know, kind of looking at our specific community culture together. What are things that people aren't getting? What's preventing healthy sexual relationships? Um, and then, what are you taking away from today? I want to just note. So we ran through this. Uh, it took about ninety minutes to do this circle structure with the group. Uh, people ended up opting into sticking around for a full hour after the culmination of the circle, and it was interesting. Uh, the co-facilitator and I were noting that the kind of conversational turn-taking of circle practice continued really organically into that hour, so people were speaking with each other in a different way. Um, and you know, we were seeing that yeah, ongoing equality of voice from like having this practice of sitting in circle together. Uh, when we then came back together for circle three, um, when we asked this round two question of what stuck with you since the last circle, I'd say 100% of the participants talked about just the experience of sitting in circle together and how that form of having dialogue with one another felt so markedly different from anything they were used to. Um, but then this, this session got into kind of you know, exploring the impacts, um, both, both personally and collectively. Um, it went really deep. Um, there were people who chose, you know, we, we crafted questions to be open enough that you wouldn't have to disclose if you had experienced sexual harm. Some people did, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then the fourth section was what's needed to make things right. So collectively brainstorming, understanding what we now know through this dialogue of what's happening, what the impacts are, what's needed to repair harm and make things right. Um, you know, and what agency do we have? What do we as a group have in terms of agency? Uh, and this, this was interesting because what came out of this was um, the group ended up saying they wanted a fifth session to get more specific. So we met um, for an optional fifth session uh, during which they collectively produced a document of recommendations for the university of like, from this process, here's what specifically we want you to do, um, which included things like you know, additional consent education. The biggest recommendation, though, was making a process like this available to more people um, and thinking about ways to still have it be a process that people are opting into and having that kind of like consent of participation, but maybe it's tied to like, okay, if you're going to live in the dorms, um, part of that agreement is that you're opting into this process. Um, so kind of dealing with that complexity. I just in, in two minutes here, I'm going to say some of the key outcomes. So I had the privilege of working on this particular process with um, a really amazing linguistics researcher. Um, her name is uh, Dr. Amy giles Mitson. The time she was doing her dissertation, and so she did actually her, her entire dissertation on the sustained restorative dialogue process. And having her lens of looking at it as a linguist, looking at the circle process and how you know, themes like agency were emerging were so interesting. Um, Highly recommending her whole dissertation because it was just like 
really cool to kind of see it through her lens. Um, but a few kind of you know, key findings was uh, one that we were noticing a shift in perception and an enhanced understanding of sexual harm, um, increased communication around sexual harm, and then also value for, for people who have experienced sexual harm. So participants who had that experience you know, as a harmed party um, were expressing that they you know, experienced some healing benefit of this process. Um, so you know, just to uh, dial in on those in one minute, so that um, you know, enhanced understanding of sexual harm, of course, particularly salient, perhaps not surprisingly, for male participants. Um, this, uh, I'll let you just look at briefly, but um, this is from an interview that Amy did after the process, um, a male participant just reflecting on how it made him aware of what a huge, complex, pervasive issue it was, and also you know, kind of how close to home it was, essentially. Um, similarly, this is an interview with um, a female participant talking about how she was um, close friends with one of the people in the process, one of the male participants, um, and how you know, she had observed as his friend what a, you know, <laughs> a, a view-expanding experience this was, how much it deepened his understanding of this issue. Um, in terms of the communication around sexual harm, um, it was associated with people feeling a lot more comfortable, just kind of like getting over that barrier to talking about it more proactively. Um, and that that, you know, is of course is key for establishing healthy norms around sex and content sex and consent in the community. Um, and so this is just a little bit more um, interview data to that point, uh, which I would be happy to follow this up since I know I'm kind of speeding through this um, for the sake of time, um, if, if this is something of interest. But um, you know, just the, the sense to really normalize talking about these issues and talking about it you know, as on an individual and cultural level. Um, and this is, this is, again, kind of speaking to that, uh, that dynamic of that um, building comfort in talking about this stuff. And then the final point here in terms of um, this being having potential as a model to help people heal, um, having the opportunity, even though it wasn't a restorative justice conference like we normally would run with the responsible party, the harmed party, um, having harmed parties in particular have a space to talk about their experience, um, you know, have that met with people believing them, validating them um, was, you know, also quite a, a healing process for people to kind of engage in that discussion in that space. Um, just as a final note here, so of course additional research is needed to understand <laughs> um, impacts. Uh, one thing that's been really interesting, uh, this, so this happened in 2019, some of the implementation of this, of course, was a little bit of a COVID casualty. <laughs> Circles have been rough um, in the last few years. Uh, what's been interesting, though, is the adaptation of this model that I'm involved with now is um, with a group, a university in New York who wants to use it to look at equity and particularly racial harm issues in their community, which again feels related to there being momentum um, with you know, the Black Lives Matter movement in the states. Um, but I think you know, ultimately we felt encouraged by the outcomes that this is a model that you know, has some uh, potential for helping us find real tangible ways to address these broader culture climate issues that are at the root of harm. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Yes.